actually Going start crossing. the show. Yeah, and... save the cinnamon conversation for later. <laughs> Not now. Oh, Three, two. What is up, everybody? Welcome to Comic Book Club. Woo, I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And we are coming to you live from a couple of places on the internet. We are live on Crowdcast. We're live on YouTube. Maybe you're listening to us later on iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice, wherever you're listening or watching. Thank you Thank for checking you. us out. We appreciate it. We have a bunch of great guests on the show to you today that I'm very excited to bring in. But first, we should talk about the drink of the week. Ah. Now, yeah, we should talk about the drink of the week. Now, our resident chef, <coughs> Brett Macris, has been curating drinks from the Gotham right, City boys. cocktail book. This week, we are drinking the Elegy, which is a drink that Ooh. Keith Kathy Kane drinks. Uh, I made it with too much salsa. Too much yeah. salsa. Come on, man. But I didn't it's... have, I made it as well. I didn't have uh, juice, so I just used Aperol, which is more mm. alcohol. So that's, um, just, it's, a, it's sort of a juice of booze. It, it sounds booze like juice. a combination apple and alcohol. Uh, mm. Yeah, so it's dry vermouth, blanc vermouth, pomegranate juice, club soda, and a lemon twist for garnish. It's very refreshing. I have never just had two vermouths before, but I guess that's how Kathy Kane does it. Wow. So who am I to say differently? You're like a 60-year-old Italian man uh, sitting in the, playing bocce in the afternoon. And I mean that literally Ooh. and with his oh, drink. Oh, man. <laughs> I have actually a bocce set right over there. I Pete, love speaking bocce. of bocce, he plays I, I bocce love... uh, on the weekends. That's right. Yeah? I have yes, you, you're all man. falling to pieces. Bo- you're all falling to pieces in front of my eyes. <laughs> talking about There's nothing like drinking in the afternoon sun, a little bocce. Come on. Yeah, cigar, talk about uh, World War II when you fought in it. Yep, yep. Nice. Later on in the show, we are going to have Max Allen Collins here to talk about his new book, Fancy Andrews Goes to War. But first, we're going to bring in our first two guests, see uh, if they can work it out, talk about their new project, uh, which is Stan Lee's <laughs> Alliance. I, I was clicking a lot of things at the same time. Stan Lee's uh-huh. Alliance, A New Reality, which is out now on Audible. They are Ryan Silbert and Luke Lieberman. And hey, we got Luke here. Let's see if hey Ryan can make his way in, too. He was having some audio is... problems before the show. Hey, this is is how does that one work? Yeah. So oh, much yeah. There we go. There you go. Woo-hoo. You got it. Uh, guys, Only a you. voice my mother can love. <laughs> no, this is good. <laughs> I like the... And you guys. Holding up, holding yeah. up the yeah. microphone. We love it. Spinner rack in the background, dude. Kill it. Very cool. Whoa. Wait, before we get into your book and everything going on to it, uh, what do you have on the spinner rack, Ryan? Me? Well, I'm moving uh, on Friday, so it's getting cleared out here. But I got oh. uh, the old killer. I've got some of the uh, Wasted Space, Cold War, Thumbs, Summer Blondes. Thumbs. Nice. Thumbs. You know, San Francisco. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Where are you How do you rotate? To? Oh, we have different both ways. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know. DC side and, I, you know. I know. <laughs> it's all goes. Headlopper, actually. I think you guys turned oh, me Oh, yeah. yeah. Headlopper. Yeah. Headlopper. Is sick. Big fans. That's I'm your... the number one fan, actually, of Headlopper. Oh, I, I, I never goodness. heard of it until you told me about it last two years ago. You know, said, there you go. We're here to help, especially. Patented me. Justin Tyler bump is my Are there know. decapitations involved I, in that in that book? It, it, Maria Kondo, <laughs> you got to touch it to give it joy. So yeah, yeah. Here's right. the thing about Headlopper. I like the issues where there is head lopping, and occasionally there's issues where there is no head lopping, and it's a real disappointment. Well, that's the you thing. Do... They really they pick and choose, and they really want you to want it. You can't always just mm. expect yeah. Yeah. For free. The title really like when... Luke's writing then. He likes to head law everything in any <laughs> a, any comic he's ever written. A lot of heads on the floor. Nice. Well, let's <laughs> talk about that then. Let's talk about Stanley's Alliance a new reality which as mentioned is out from Audible now. So this is the second I mean what what do you categorize that since it's Audible exclusive? Is it a book? Does it does wow. it even Whoa, count as a book, dude, man? What are you doing? Alex, got gotcha your question off the jump. <laughs> or is it a radio show, an old timey radio show? Ooh, yeah, there's something else called um, uh, audio. Uh, Never heard of things. it. Don't, don't know what you're talking <laughs> about. An audio event? <laughs> yeah. Is it, not, is it an audio event? I forgot. I don't know what the uh, what the term is in the paper, but I I, I believe that uh, at some point we will be able to print this into book form or perhaps in graphic novel form. So. At some point, it will be a book you can hold in your hand. Nice. Very exciting. 
but it was one of those things where you you have to suffer with will reading reading it to you at this point (laughs) oh man that guy (laughs) you know we did it because stan was really into that whole vibe you know like making this into an audio original from the onset because as you guys know like the whole comic form that he developed with the Marvel universe connected and all the cliffhangers came out of the serial radio dramas. So that's why we launched it this way. Yeah. Well, I feel like Stan was a big fan of like crossing media. He was always like writing that's comics cool. with an eye toward doing something else with them. Well, this was also an opportunity, I think, to do something a little different for me. He'd never done an audio book, which it, at some level, I remember it just kind of came up and he's like, Oh, I haven't done one of those. Like it just the idea that it was something he hadn't done before in his early nineties when we were talking about this was kind of in and of itself a good enough reason to go this direction. But I think he also liked the idea that there was this kind of collaboration with the listener because he w- we were gonna kind of paint a picture with words, but there wasn't gonna be an artist there to spoon feed a spoon feed you the visuals you were going to have to kind of make them up yourself and kind of be the collaborative partner i think it is is something that really appeals to him. it's it's true that kevin said in the tr- chat that stan did do audio dramas he did a uh, doctor strange in the 60s and he did ff yeah. in the 70s but um this is for original characters like things that were developed for the audio medium so that there was never you know no underlying material there to start with yeah. now what was different then about taking this world that you created for the first book and then moving it to audio for the second book. Were there any challenges? Was there anything in There was an audio. Was the first yeah. book what premiered on Audible also. Oh, then I don't know what so I'm talking about. It came about. out as a book. There was a six-month window where it was only on Audible, and then the print book followed. Oh, okay. Never mind that. Retract it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but to take the flip of Alex's question, so then how do you develop directly for audio? Like, what, what's the process like? I think, let me put this. I mean, it actually kind of, since we went into it in that direction, I guess I really didn't, first of all, developing our development process and the kind of world building process started years prior. And it was just this kind of big expansive world building exercise where we didn't really know. I mean, we didn't, when we started this process out with Stan, we certainly didn't know that it was going to end up as an audio book. That wasn't the vision for it or anything else. Right. We, we were just creating stories and characters and a kind of world for all this to exist in. And then when Audible became uh, a possible sort of initial release, then we, you know, kind of took some of the story and characters out of our development and ran with it as the first story. You know, this is Stan kind of shows what should be the initial story in the world, but it wasn't developed. Now, when you're talking about sort of after that point, once we were on board with Audible and we were writing a story sort of specifically to start there, I guess I didn't really think of it as um, as any different than writing any other kind of manuscript. We did notice, actually, it was more when we went from Audible and HMH and our editor at HMH wanted to flesh out a bunch of the descriptions and things like that. Um, there was actually a, a fair bit of rewriting and sort of there was more meat added onto it once it went into printed form. So I think it was actually sort of leaner and meaner in the... Uh, in the original audio manuscript, Ryan can tell me if I'm wrong there. No, that's about right. I mean, it's it. Those two mediums are very similar, obviously, because we're taking a manuscript and creating audio around it. And you know, in the future, there'll be some, you know, additional multi-voice kind of opportunities, like more like a radio play. But the best, like the best in class, having Will Wheaton do the reading on this, I think, is like is what lifts things off the page and makes it like an imaginative experience for a listener. I don't know if you guys listen to audiobooks on like going to sleep, but like you know, my I tend to listen to like you know Joe Hill and like Stephen King stuff while. Uh, sleeping, so it's never. Wow. Uh, it's a very different yeah. kind of experience. Yeah. Wait, while you're sleeping? Yeah, it's a nightmare. It's just just walking right into a nightmare. <laughs> you know, twentieth century, twentieth century ghosts can you know. Make well, you wait. So I have a question because what? I I usually read before I go to sleep. At the point I know I need to stop reading is when my eyes are rolling back in my head. I'm like, mm-hmm. well, close the book, put it away. If you're listening to an audio book when you're going to sleep, do you? know where to go back to or are you skipping whole okay. chunks or how are you just I, using I have, it as I white figured noise this out, which is that you just put it i it's a 45 minute you just put a stop point it's like you can put a you can you know you, you just mm. tell the device how long to play for so that you're never that far off i usually just give myself 45 minutes and mm. 
I'm not, you know, that's so I got to back up 15. Although it's going to sound really bad and conceited, but I've actually been listening to New Reality to go to sleep for like the last two months. And that's nice. Sort of, <laughs> to me, it just puts me right out, and I don't have to worry about getting lost in the story because, you know. I don't know if uh, New Reality puts you right to sleep is exactly the thing that you want to put out there. <laughs> 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 me, me as a, just me as, just he, as a, as a working guy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like how I just listened to an edited down version of our podcast where it's just Pete talking. From yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just silence and white noise. At, at yeah. this point. <laughs> it's comforting to me. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, very obvious, and I think everybody knows this, but unfortunately, we are now post Stan at this point. You know, he laid down the ideas for this thing. He worked with you guys clearly on this project. But what is it like releasing it now that he is no longer around? I think I, I felt that more intensely, actually, with the first release, um, because the first one, you know, we finished it while he was with us but the release and you know re the recording of yara who did the reading of the book and uh and the release through audible was six months after he passed i want to say something like that and so it was all very um present and sort of intense and mostly at that point what i was thinking was just i wish he was here to see this i mean that was the kind of thought going through my head i mean i had a little bit I still had that thought with new reality, but it kind of wasn't as fresh and it wasn't quite as, you know, it wasn't the same thing. Um, I think, you know, the, the obligation is that you just want to, you just want to feel like you're doing something he would be proud of. I mean, new reality is a story where he had a lot of, um, you know, I mean, he obviously wasn't around for the scripting on that one, but he, he, a lot of the story elements and things like that came from development that we did with him. So he was, very present in that story but um i guess it's it's you wish that you could have i mean when the i remember when the first book was printed when trick of light was printed all i wanted to do was just be able to like bring it in and hand it to him and say here stan here's what here's what happened with you know here it is look we made it you know and that was kind of it was upsetting that we couldn't do that um with new reality i think i just i think he would have liked to have seen kind of how that came out i think he would have I think he would have liked where we landed with that. I just, you know, obviously I wish he, I wish he could have seen it. Yeah. Are there more plans that you laid out for other books at this point with him, or is this kind of as far as you went? No, like we, we, um, this, so this development process, I guess, so people who don't know, like Stan gave me my first job after film school and oh, he wow. was kind of a, a friend and mentor of mine for decades and uh, my day job was actually right down the street from his office. So I used to just go over and lunches and kind of hang with him. And, uh, you know, not every day, but, you know, once a week, once every two weeks, I would just call his assistant up and say, hey, when Stan free? When does he have a minute? And I would just wander into his office and catch up with him. And then we started coming up with ideas around sort of the inception of the Internet and his sort of disillusionment with what it was supposed to be and what it turned into. And... Um, um, that process was about five years long. So there was just a lot of characters and whatnot that haven't been worked in yet that we have lying around. There's a project that we're not allowed to announce yet, but it's going to be announced soon. It's a little frustrating to us actually that we aren't ready to announce it just yet. But yeah, I see uh, the look on your face is like, I want to say this so hard right <laughs> I now. Agree, but, I can't, I can't. but what I will tell you is that there is, you know, in there, there are, there's the kind of world that we set up with him and we, we try to sort of be precise about it. There's part of the story that is literally something that was written um, where he was very involved in the conception of this particular scene and whatnot, where he'll actually have attribution as a writer. And then the rest of the story was based on development that we did with him. But Ryan and I are kind of running with it at that point. So we kind of and they'll be also visually separated because there's I never mind. I've already given away too much. So never mind. I'm going to I'm going to show up. <laughs> yeah, but there, are, look, there are 50 there are 50 plus characters <laughs> that that have not been revealed yet at this point. So like we it, it, this was all supposed to be from the jump, like street level heroes. That's how 
a trick of light was it built on a new reality explored sort of the inception of the internet in the 90s at least you know so with this idea of like early internet prodigy aol you know that compu mm-hmm. that kind of stuff and then exactly w- which one was the blue was that for compu <laughs> or for yeah. Prodigy? what are you repping pete i'm so uh, curious good 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 times remembering all that fun stuff so many questions, yeah, I mean, not not the right time to ask about them, but I want to hear your CompuServe but, journaling story. <laughs> so that, but that, well, that is actually, so that is the genesis of a new reality story with Stan was that it was this idea that, you know, like Luke was saying, the genesis of the internet he was curious about, well, what happens to these digital Atlantises that all went underwater when the internet, you know, breaks up? Like there's whole cultures and societies that don't long, no longer exist. Obviously, we take that into the science fiction realm, right? So that's the reality. Yeah. And then, you know, these new projects that we're developing now off of that, you know, builds from the street level, you know, to the sky and then beyond. So, you know, you can imagine where that kind of goes if you follow the simple kind of Marvel <laughs> Stan framework from the 60s. Yeah. Uh, now, Stan, famous for cameos in um, uh, the, all the MCU stuff. Is there an idea or uh, something that he came up with that really you feel like you're, you're, is his cameo? Um, in in either of these projects, well, he did the uh, he did the opening. I mean, he recorded a uh, his introduction to both of them, so that would be sort of his direct cameo for the audio. I mean, he actually sort of appears at the beginning of the book. Um, in terms, uh, yeah, of, I mean, there, I mean more in just like the the genesis, the creative process. Yeah, I mean, he he was involved in really all of the characters. Um, there's one character in particular that we kind of. I don't want to say we modeled it off of him. I mean, the, the, the inventor is always, I've always kind of seen that as, you know, but by Stan Sands. I mean, there was a point in time where we actually thought about trying to have Stan there, record the audio of that character and that's we just didn't work out. But. but the spoiler, like spoilers aside for the books, but one of them has been out for a while now. Like, you know, the idea that there are multiple kind of inventions of reality of people like reinventing themselves. So like Stan, that is very much a Stan um, imbued mm. idea mm. and all those characters nia is a you know uh, i think we can talk about this at this point you know is an artificial intelligence that mimics <laughs> as a that poses as a 16 year old or you know teen on the internet as a real person and but with no friends you know they, they, they don't connect that way and similarly cameron is a character who's a young character sort of like a inverted tony stark bad at inventions wants to be a youtuber but you know presents himself differently on the internet those are all things that are very stan because i mean you know he yeah, and the, and he the created he, he, he yeah. created characters like that with yeah. spider-man he created the char- characters like that in his own life you know with his reinvention of who he was as an actor and as a writer and as an editor as a publisher as a marketer you know he's always changing kind of hats so yeah well, there was also, I think, kind of the fundamental issue, particularly in Trick of Light, had to do with identity and this idea of a kind of the alter ego that you have, the the sort of digital online identity that you have, and then who you really are and what the dynamic and the relationships are between, you know, who you are and what you present to the world and your sort of curated, man, you know, manicured presentation of yourself as opposed to the kind of raw, real version of yourself. And that that's... First of all, that was something that very much came from Stan, but that's also that's a, a theme and a concept that we're going to keep playing with as we move forward on other things. Yeah. I mean, speaking of other things, though, it sounds like I'd imagine you kind of at least have talked about this in some sense, but you've got the audio books, you've got the printed paper books. Are there thoughts to expand into other medium as well? Oh, Edward. hold on a second. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Okay. There'll be there'll be a lot of the mediums that like we could explore with this are kind of you know very wide. I mean, I think that certainly you know comics for sure because that's you know the roots of Stan, but also something that Luke you know has done a lot of over the last ten years. Um, you know, TV and film because also you know we have backgrounds in that. But you know we're like always looking for good partners, and I think like kind of what the you know basis of all of these projects are it's like finding best in class kind of partners like mm-hmm. will audible harper collins um yara you know like that that's kind of like the elevated kind of point of view we're taking with it so like any of the kind of mediums we enter we're always looking for like the best best kind of partners well i think by the way that's kind of like when you're talking earlier about what it feels like to do stuff now without stan i mean i think one of the basic obligations is that we're not trying to just 
schlock IP out that, you know, let's, let's go make a, you know, here's a cash grab. We'll make an animation with this crappy company over here or whatever, where everything's got to be premium. Everything's got to be with, you know, best in class partners. The thing that I'm not allowed to talk about is because one of our best in class partners is slow with his work, but well, that's, <laughs> no, everybody's fast. Everybody's fast. <laughs> Nobody's fast. You, you have you wear too many things. But like yeah, that, yeah, but, yeah, that, yeah, but yeah. that's the, but you know you guys. I think we talked about this last time I was on. Like, I've I've become so disillusioned with this idea of like comics becoming like IP. Like, what do they call it? Like IP farm or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like then like podcast became that. Like all the things that I love. Become I mean, I wish. Something else. I wish they become that. But go. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. You guys are all cast. Play a cool. Come on. Play a cool, Justin. Is that yeah, play it cool. Come on. Yo, take it easy. Yeah. What I'm if there's about a about premium, uh, premium person listening out? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But like, you know, like, that's for us. It's not about that. Like, we don't. I don't want to make stuff that just is like supposed to be ported somewhere else. Like, I just want to make good stuff like in the in the place yeah. that we're making it. So like, if it's good audio, it should be good audio. Good like good comics should just be good comics. It shouldn't be like oh, with an eye towards. I don't know. I like yeah, the. Old, that, I mean, I like the Ultimate and, Universe, but you know, it always felt like a lot. A lot of this will be sort of driven yes. by you know who's who are the sort of. It's, it's going to be driven by quality. So what what medium do we feel like we can produce quality in? And that's a lot of that's going to depend depend on who our partners are in the medium and whatnot. I mean, we're not opposed to any medium. Obviously, stuff like books and comics or national publishing is is kind of natural for this because that's a genesis. But beyond that, it's it's going to be a matter of where we think we can create something um, that would make Stan proud, and that yeah. you know Stan would be happy to be associated with. That's really going to be where we choose to go, and we're not in any hurry. We're, we have a very long view of this. Well, to that end, though, I mean, not to keep pushing you on this, but you have the first two out. Are you working on the third one at this point, or is that still yeah. a question mark? You yeah, yeah, no. The the third one's, like, for, for sure, as you could see from, like, the way we've done it, it's like, this is a prequel. Then we had this other, you know, but kind of prequel sequel. Then we had Trick of Light as other foundation, and then we're going, you know, to other dimensions in space. So, you know, it'll be well, fun. See, you're already getting, nice. we, we're trying so hard not to talk about this stuff, but... Other dimensions in space. Other dimensions in space. I mean, I, it just occurred to me the other day that, like, and I think we could debate about this all day. In Endgame, in Endgame, are they throwing? Because if if Doctor Strange gets his magic from other dimensions and he's throwing things at Thanos, is, are they throwing dimensions at that? Is like a dimensional fight plus a planet getting thrown? And what happens to the other dimensions? I'm asking you. I'm asking you guys. Yeah. Uh, well. I mean, opening the door to the multiverse is everything is doing that right now. So, yes, I would say 100%. Even if it wasn't intended to be that, when we look back on a scene in an episode of uh, Loki mm-hmm. season four, yeah, that's going to be a couple of <laughs> <gonna throw> <laughs> Dimension throwing. That's an Olympic sport. I love it. Yeah, uh, future uh, Olympics. Yeah, gold medal for me, I think, in that one. Guys, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. Congratulations on the project. Very excited to see the next one. Very excited to see whatever it is you're teasing. Yeah. yeah. No, the teasing yeah, we'll is back. I feel teased. I'm you'll fully know. teased right now. You'll know. When it happens, you'll know. Awesome. You guys will Very know. exciting. Guys, have a great night. Uh, good Thank you. you. Good luck Thank with your you. move, Ryan. Yes. Yes. Bye-bye, guys. Yeah. Bye. All right, there we go. Once again, that's Ryan Silbert and Luke Lieberman from Stanley's Alliance, A New Reality, which is out now on Audible. Definitely go check it out. And now we're going to invite our next guest into the stream here. Hopefully, fingers crossed, this works. Uh, But he is probably best known for Road to Perdition uh, by this audience here, but he has a new book called Fancy Anders Goes to War, which is out digitally on October 5th that we are going to talk to him about. His name is Max Allen Collins. Uh, and uh, we'll see if he comes in here. And here oh. he comes. And come on oh, down. <laughs> there we go. Hello. Look at that. How are you? Max, thank you so much for coming on the show. That was a very interesting half hour. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah. So let's talk about this book. Let's talk about Fancy Anders Goes to War, which is the kickoff of a new series. And I believe the concept is, is it actually Rosie the Riveter dies or somebody like Rosie the Riveter dies? Well, well, well. See, I'm getting a terrible echo here. Is there something I should do? Um, maybe if you have some headphones, maybe that would work. Possibly. 
Are you hearing? Yes, yes. we are. Yes. <laughs> you sound very powerful. Yeah, I, you I really respect. do. It's very impressive. This, yeah, should, very... this should be a Stan Lee. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> He's haunting. I need help, guys. I don't know what to do about this. Yes. Well, if you don't have headphones, you could probably... Do you have speakers going on or anything like that? Maybe okay. the speakers are doing it. Yeah, maybe if you turn them down a little bit. Oh, oh. There's some power there. That's where... There's some juice there. Is that... No yeah. yeah. Uh, there we go. That's called problem solving, and I can't Live believe it worked. tech okay. help. That's that turned me off, didn't it? No, you're yeah. there. We hear you. We can hear you. We can hear you great. Yeah. Don't... Don't touch a thing. You're doing great. Is that better? Oh, Echo, Echo's I'm, back. Is that all right? Here's what I would say, um, and I love doing this live. If you have separate speakers that are exterior to your computer, maybe unplug them and your computer audio will take over because I think the echo is from the speakers well, interplaying. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, you sound perfect right now. Perfect. Don't do anything else. Okay, but I've got to be able to hear you. That's the right. problem. That's the trick. Okay. Oh, can, can you, you hear, us? hear us right now? Okay, I, I think we can do this. Okay. Go All right. Ahead. We got this. All right. I think that would have made a good half hour, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, Our talk with God. Uh, Fancy Anders is not a comic book. It's a kind of a... I mean, I'm a comic book writer at times, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, but what happened was we, we asked this uh, very good... Um, artist in the UK, Faye Dalton, to do the cover. And when we saw the cover, I said, well, then we got to have illustrations. <laughs> and I love the whole retro idea. It kind of went back to my wife used to tell me about when she was a kid, reading the old Nancy Drew books that yeah. had been like her, probably her grandmother's, that had running boards and had all this old 40s stuff, and how she hated all the updated because I think they've updated Nancy Drew probably five times. But this was back when they were probably in, you know, 40s automobiles, 30s automobiles. She loved that. So they always had those illustrations, those one-pagers that would maybe be the first thing leading into a chapter. So I just thought it was a cool retro thing to, to, to invoke. And she, Faye Dalton, this is so incredible. Uh, and they're in the in the ebook they're all in color in the oh, nice. in the book book they're in black and white but eventually we'll, we will do a color version i think in a larger format i didn't answer your question but Ro rosie the riveter is presented more <laughs> as which is true as, as a um marketing campaign as a pr campaign right and in the terms of the story this there's a woman who had been chosen to be the model for rosie the riveter to be the, the one who would get her pictures taken and would would pose for Norman Rockwell and all that kind of stuff. She's who gets murdered. Oh. And Fancy Anders is a, um, she she's a very wealthy gal who who's in her early 20s. She's just got out, pretty much got out of college. And her mother's a very socialite, high society, snooty person. But the father is an ex-cop who became an incredibly important, successful, uh, in Los Angeles, private detective whose agency works for all the big studios. And so he's got money too. So, but they're from, they're very different worlds, the parents. And she is attracted more to the world of her father. And she finally works her way into being able to, to kind of work there as a secretary. And then when the war starts, he gets called up to be involved with the OSS. And he basically says to her, Watch the phone. We're going to shut the agency down, essentially. You make the referrals, dust the desks, because we're letting all the all of the agents are off fighting for whoever, for Uncle Sam. But once her father's gone and she has some opportunities to do some undercover work, um, she goes for it. And this, this is her going into a defense plant, into an aircraft plant, and what's fun to me about it is that she ha she is dealing with social classes she's never dealt with before. Because just as women got pumped into the workforce in World War II, a lot of minorities got pumped in as well. Because it was like, you know, do you have a pulse? I mean, that was basically the, that was basically the requirement. Do you have a pulse? And so 
So she goes in and she's working with, you know, uh, Hispanics and blacks and whoever, and a few men who have not changed much. So there's sexist activity underway, which she has to deal with. So she's a fish out of water in that sense. But on, in another sense, these are very traditional private eye mystery stories. And I would say she's sort of like, uh, she's a little bit in the ballpark of my mystery character who, who you guys may be familiar with. Well, and oh, go ahead, we'll, Justin. Uh, what put you in this world? Uh, what made you want to dive into this uh, very specific um, time and place? Well, you, you, again, I heard you mention Road to Perdition, so you know I have a kind of a affinity for the 30s and 40s, mm -hmm. and I've written a lot about the 30s and 40s. Um, I spent most of my life in the 20th century. I'm not that crazy about the 21st century so far. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you guys don't have much choice, do you? But here we are. Yeah, yeah. Here we are. I mean, none of us have a lot of choices unless you have an idea we don't know about. Yeah, There's exactly. Unless you know something that well, we don't know. That's another book. Can... That's another book. Uh, okay. All right. All that's right. coming in about a month. Okay. Uh, but um, I, I never really have done Hollywood in L.A., much in, in the historical detective stuff I've done. And because uh, I did, I, I have a character called Nathan Heller, who's been in about 15 books, and every single one of them is about a real crime, a real unsolved or oh, wow. controversially solved crime. Hmm. So so I've done the Lindbergh kidnapping. Some of them are, aren't crimes so much as, as mysteries. Like I've done Amelia Earhart. I've done Roswell. I've done all this stuff. Wow with a private eye with a very traditional philip marlowe my camera kind of private eye in period because i didn't want to just do a period private eye i wanted to do something that was had a more historical basis now fancy anders is a little bit more fanciful pardon that <laughs> but, uh, there actually there, there actually is a, a real crime at, at the heart of of some of what's going on and it's, uh, you know, it's fairly tough stuff. It, it was in real life a bathtub murder. Mm -hmm. Someone who was, you know, a woman who was strangled in the bathtub, which is not uh, a cozy teacup kind of mystery story. No. No. Well, this is the flip side of Justin's question, but what keeps drawing you back to mystery in particular? Because that's something, like you're pointing out, you've written dozens if not hundreds of times well, i think i think genre fiction is is attractive in general because it almost all is set up so there's inherently a conflict mm -hmm. and a story isn't really a story as far as i'm concerned if it doesn't have a conflict when you're doing mystery and and crime inherently there's a conflict somebody got murdered somebody got robbed what somebody got swindled uh and so strangled you, in a bathtub so Great example. So you walk in the door with something already going on. And the other thing is, you know, what I get hit on a lot, it has have many writers in this in this area, um, is the sex and violence. You know, that's they always say, why do you do sex and violence? But what I what I always say is, well, sex is life and violence is death. And those are kind of the two big topics. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's true. Yeah. And so I think, uh, and, and uh, you know, some of the major mystery writers, I, I, I'm, I'm involved with the estate of Mickey Spillane continuing the Mike Hammer stuff. Mm. And Mickey was a comic book writer. He was a mm. contemporary of Stan Lee's in the Golden Age. Mm. Mickey wrote for Timely Comics. He was wow. working at the fa the the um, uh, Funnies Incorporated, oh, who wow. did the, did Marvel yeah. number one. Yeah, and yeah. So he he was a writer. On, some of what he wrote is a little obscure now, but he did Blue Bolt, and he did he did some Captain America. He had a lot of uh, he did a lot of Submariner. Huh. Yeah. I mean, one of the first things he told you when you started talking comics was that, you know, was that. Uh, uh, Namor was uh, Roman spelled backwards, you know. <laughs> he, he, he thought that was cool. And wow, so, I've uh, never known that. Yeah, never. yeah, the, yeah. Namor's yeah. your favorite. He, that's your guy. Really? Oh, wow. Well, no, he, he's not my guy. But well, you kind of remind me of him a lot. 
You know, uh, that's weird. Okay, yeah. it's the my <laughs> I mean, ankle it's wings. It's funny about comic book characters. I, I I know I would have comic book characters that had some obvious pun that I never I never saw. There, yeah. there was a character in in a comic strip called Joe Palooka. The girlfriend was named Anne Howe. I never put together and how. Oh, right? that's really funny. <laughs> I mean, I probably read it 20 years. And when I went, oh, I think that's, yeah. Now, some people do get Ms. Tree pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> pretty much on the that one I got to, yeah. yeah. Uh, Imperious yeah. Rex. Okay, it makes a lot of sense now that I think about we, it. We've got a question well, I was here. Gonna call Road, I was going to call Road to Perdition uh, Gun and Son. <laughs> I think it's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, it is fun. <laughs> What do you think it is about that one in particular <laughs> that has stuck around so long in the imagination? Like, clearly that hit with comic book fans and non-comic book fans like in a very big way. Which which is... Road to Perdition in particular. Well, you know, it, it was really startling at the time because initially... DreamWorks wanted to hide the fact that it was from a graphic novel. Mm -hmm. So funny. The very first poster said based on the novel by oh. <laughs> and we we insisted that they put graphic novel oh that's so funny what a change has occurred since that well, day. I, I was walking down the i was at, at the premiere in chicago red carpet and you know dreamworks kind of wanted to keep me you know, they didn't really want me around i i, I called up and said you know <laughs> I did create this. I'd kind of like to come here. It'd be cool if yeah, I got rid of this. So I'm walking on the red carpet, and the thing that people were shouting at me was, Max, Max, what's a graphic novel? Uh, <laughs> You're and, like, that's sort of a over... long answer. So <laughs> give me a <laughs> Well, then, then over the next uh, you know, two, three weeks when all the promo was happening, I did interviews with USA Today and Entertainment Weekly, and the subject was, what's a graphic novel? Wow, that's so funny. Because, and, and if you think about it, there weren't just a lot, there were a few from undergrounds, but there weren't really a lot of movies made from comics that weren't uh, superhero. Yeah. yeah. And there really weren't that many superhero at the time, but there were some, obviously. Yeah. So um, that has stuck around. I think that the fact that it is, to some degree, an American take on lone wolf and cub it has a major part of how it's stuck around uh and doesn't hurt that the movie had tom hanks and yeah. uh you know paul newman and th there was this new guy named daniel craig and huh. you know, huh. an incredible cast yeah. Well, and uh, right. Edward Doherty here in the comments points out that Tyler Hoechlin, who's playing Superman now yeah. on the Sudivy, was a little he's kid. He's still in the DC universe. Yeah. It's so <laughs> funny. <laughs> still in the DC universe. That's uh, awesome. This is a question from Kevin in the comments. Particularly with mysteries, how does the medium from prose to comic book to comic strip affect your approach? Well, first, I have an admission to make, which is when, when people ask me, artistically how do you decide which which <laughs> one you'll do it's like who's 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 buying yeah, yeah. <laughs> got the right. the honesty. Yeah. yeah yeah and so so but it, there's a lot of differences i think what i really like about comics and i was attracted to comics initially i mean as a kid that's what i wanted to do was to do comic sure. books yeah. and comic strips i just think that the the combination of music you know words and music it's 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 pictures and and words and when you get somebody that can do the right balance and isn't being too redundant it's it's hard to beat and and it's it's this in between novels what i like about novels is that you really are you you create a movie that plays in the head of of the reader yeah. but the bad thing for me is that I have that collaborator, right? <laughs> nice. And and then, you know, sometimes I play Broadway, and sometimes <laughs> I play the Three Mile Island Community Theater, <laughs> <laughs> and that's uh, out of my hands, great. you know. Yeah. But with with comics and with movies, what you see is what you get, yeah. and there's there's less to argue right. about, and there's, I th I think one of the reasons why comic book fandom happened. 
And I kind of saw it happen because let me tell you, while I was in high school, I was the guy that read, read comic books. <laughs> right. I was that strange guy that read comic books. Yeah. And I, this is this is mid sixties. This is and and what changed it. Nobody wants to hear this, but what changed it was the Batman TV show because mm -hmm. right. that's when people started reading comics. That's when the Marvel comics took off. Yeah. And changed everything. But I think that the thing about comics fandom is because it's a, such a shared experience that it, it makes you a community. Right. And it's an unruly community, granted, <laughs> but it does make you a community. No, go ahead, Justin. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I really love that that thought because I feel like the rise of comic fandom has come at a time when everyone's sort of community is built less around who they're actually physically around and what their interests are. And so the fact that comics have been able to become this like almost prime time community, uh, all of it, like someone like you who was like waiting in the wings for this to happen uh, a little bit for us who were sort of uh, behind you in that. But now it's just like, that community is so large. I wonder what the experience is like for people picking up comics now for the first time. I think it's just kind of accepted as as one of the storytelling art forms, and I it's really what it should be if you get right down yeah. to it. Uh, I mean, I I look back on how how I used to have to defend comics. Oh yeah, man. And that doesn't happen. I mean, you still do to kind of to a certain degree, but. But, you know, I, when I was a really little kid, and I'm talking about five, six, seven years old, that's when Dr. Wordham was oh, yeah. doing his thing. And uh, they used to, in Parents, Com in Parents Magazine, and every parent bought it, every month they would list the comics you weren't supposed to let your kid read. Oh, wow. Most most of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, 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 you know, now my, my saving grace was my mother – had fallen in love with the Dick Tracy comic strip when yeah. she was uh. in San Diego when my dad was in in the Navy during World War II. It hadn't been in the Iowa newspaper she she saw as a, as a little girl, and she she loved the strip. And so when I was I swear five, six years old, she introduces me to Dick Tracy. Wow! And we're talking about bullets flying through brains and yeah, God yeah. bless her. <laughs> and, and and I just uh, I've never I've never been right since. I mean, honestly. <laughs> well, but you ended up writing. You're, Dick, you ended up writing Dick Tracy too, right? So that must have felt well. Like, yeah, that, uh, that's quite bizarre, circle. really. Yeah, I did. Um, when I was seven, my mother sent. This is not going to be as long as stories. This isn't. I'm not going to talk to you about the log cabin I was raised in or anything. Uh, <laughs> But when I was seven, my mom got together a bunch of my Dick Tracy drawings and sent them to Chester Gould, the creator of Dick Tracy. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And then on my eighth birthday, I got a drawing from him. Ah. And then awesome. so then I began to write him and say, uh, someday when you get tired of doing the strip, I'd like to do the strip. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that didn't exactly get answered. But years later, uh, when I started my first few books came out my first novels came out i sent them to, to gould and we, we'd corresponded when i was a little kid for a little while so he mm -hmm. kind of remembered me and so i began oh, going in and so seeing cool. him became friends with him and um it was you know in, in the tribune tower i get to go up and see him working at his drawing board wow. i was at this point i would have been probably 23 years old or so 22 23 and so um, a few years later, in 1977, he, he was going to retire. And uh, the, I don't know if he ever recommended me, but I had a weird situation where some, I'd written some books, mystery novels, crime novels, that had a character in them who was a comic book fan. Mm. And when the Tribune Syndicate was looking for somebody to take Dick Tracy over, they decided they'd get a mystery writer. Mm -hmm. And so when they asked around, several people said, well, there's this guy in Iowa, I would say this <laughs> kid in Iowa, who seems, you know, who's a mystery writer, seems to know something about Dick, about comics and Dick Tracy. And then as happens, I had tried to, I had sold a comic strip idea to 
a newspaper syndicate and the and he and it got bought but the editor got fired ah. but they went to the, that particular individual a guy named rick marshall and he rec and he recommended me so they'd heard my name ah. from a couple of people and so i get a phone call and they asked me if i would would try out for it and they said they're having a talent hunt and so you know, I, knew, I had worked on a newspaper in college, and I knew about deadlines. Oh, yeah. So I wrote, <laughs> the, the, wrote the story overnight. There was no FedEx. Sent it, uh, you know, special delivery. And in two days, I had a phone call, and they invited me to Chicago. Wow. So I was sitting in this hotel room with the, the pro publisher and editor of Tribune Media Services, and you may have had this happen to you. Sometimes you're in a job interview, and about halfway through, you realize this isn't an interview. I have this job. Yeah, uh, I love it. I mean, and don't, right? you sort of see it's a great feeling, but it's also a little scary because you're like, oh, now what do I do? <laughs> now you have to turn it around, right? You gotta, yeah, you gotta be like, okay, let's do this, as opposed to like, well, so I'm good at this. Yeah. And it's like, oh, it's well, time to talk about doing it. One of the things they asked me was, they said, could you make it more like Starsky and Hutch? Because that's the big thing right now. And I said to them, I remember what I said. That I said, Starsky and Hutch will be gone in a couple of years. Dick Tracy's been here since 1931. Let's wow. not talk about Starsky and Hutch. Wow. Strong stance. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. So, so I did it for 15 years until I ran into an editor who hated me. <laughs> oh, no. and and we did not get along and uh i got uh, basically got fired off of the strip after 15 years wow, wow. and well, you... then then i went to a WonderCon and pitched road to perdition and as they say the rest is history, history. wow so, serendipitous on both ends yeah. of your work on dicks tracy like that's great it was Keep... great and I, you know i probably would have done it the rest of my life if i could have and i think and I had a good friend, an editor, a guy named Mike Gold, who was an editor at DC, who said, would have been the worst thing in the world to happen to you if you had kept doing it. <laughs> because it required me to try to do other things. And, yeah. and I do see that's a difference, I think, today among comics creators. I think that they don't necessarily say, okay, I'm going to write the Avengers for 100 issues. Oh, for sure. I, almost the opposite. It's like, hey, I, I, I have these three arcs I want to do, and then... I'm out. And I think that's healthier creative from a creative standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, that all said, do you ever get a hankering to go back to comics at any point? In terms of writing them? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I did. I, yeah, I still do now and then I did a couple of years ago, a year or two ago. I did, I have a character called Quarry. Who's a hitman who's appears in, in, in novels and has for many years. And I did, and, and there was a TV show on Cinemax based on those novels. Yes. Called Quarry. And then, and so I did a graphic novel, uh, a Quarry graphic novel, and uh, that was for Titan. And then I also did a My Camera graphic novel for Titan. Hmm. And there are also um, two other Road to Perdition graphic novels. Right. I haven't done anything that's sort of, well, I think, you know, I've done a few things. I did a couple of Batman uh graphic novels I, one i'm probably really proud of is i i did the english version of kia asamiya's child of dreams oh, wow. which yeah. is really and i think if you want to see my batman work that's what you should should look at yeah, great wow. rank yeah thank uh, you bro. well cool and fancy anters is out on october 5th right is it just so digital or it... it's as i say it's a novella okay so it, it's about 30,000 words, but it will be available in, you guys look to me like physical media guys. <laughs> you got that right. And, and because that was a thing I insisted on because it was originally bought basically as an ebook. And mm -hmm. I said, I, I got to have, I got to see it. I got to hold oh, it. Uh, yeah, Give me that so, paper. Yeah, I want to hold it, read and it. So, so that, that's going to happen. And, 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 and Faye Dalton's work is just phenomenal. I've done two more. I've done two more of these. And uh, that will be out over the next year and a half. And then I hope they'll be collected because Faye will have done over 30 illustrations for these. Oh, that's awesome. Wow. Full wow. color, full page. 
Awesome. Love that. I can't believe you guys found out a way to to, to hook me in here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad it worked out. It's a yeah. great, such a great I conversation. It sounds like I'm yeah. talking down a, you know, I'm in the outhouse talking down the hole. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the way that's we work. That's our podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's how podcasts work. Exactly. <laughs> down the outhouse hole. That's what we say. Let's get. Let's do this. Let's dive down the yeah, outhouse I hole. Listening to, and I, I, I met Stan a couple of times. Stan Lee a couple of times. Oh, cool. Very oh. sweet guy. Awesome. Yes. Max, thank you so much. I always much like for... the way he pretended to know me. <laughs> he, was, he was great at that. that about him? Yeah, he was. I think the couple times we interviewed him, he did that also. And I was like, there's no way you remember me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Max, thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure. Good luck with the book. Uh, very excited thank to check thank it out. Thank you so much. I know I talked over you a bit because I can't hear you that well here. But No, truly, was it was great. You're the guest. Yeah, perfect. Talk over yeah. much <laughs> All right, let's do this again sometime. Would yeah, love right. to. Yeah, Please. Thanks, thank Max. You. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Take care of yourself. All right. Oh, Max man, that was Allen fun. Collins. Yeah. yeah. Fancy Andrews Goes to War comes out October 5th, so you can check that out everywhere. Um, I, I, yes. I'm going to look up that Batman book. Yes. Uh, absolutely. Child of Dreams, he said, right? Uh, Child can of I Dreams. just mention, before we move on with the next section, my absolute favorite part of that interview was when he said bathtub murders. And to a T, every one of us were like, mm, yes, we know what that is. Oh, <laughs> All the bathtub murders. No need to explain. No, I've my, started I, so many stories with a bathtub murder. My favorite Just part like, about that was like him being the, you know, the comic book nerd uh, and like what that was like to defend comics back, yo, back in the day. It's so funny. I didn't want to get into it with Max here, but I was like, Pete, you would you prefer that comic book lifestyle. Yeah. Like I, that's why that's one of the reasons why I asked the question, because like someone growing up now doesn't have to defend it as hard. And I was like, yeah. Pete, you would actually dislike yeah. it now. Yeah. Because you want to so be out there being like, yeah, I'm reading a comic. What, what, what's it to you? Say something. Say something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, that's great. All right, folks, we're going to move on with our next section, which is my favorite section, because you all make it up. It's your audience question. Yeah. And for audience questions, all you got to do is drop a question in Ask a Question over here on Crowdcast or over on YouTube. You can drop a question in the comments. I will be keeping an eye on that. But first... Guys, time to pay a couple of bills here. Attention, oh, oh listeners here across the galaxy. It is time to talk about Manscaped and the Performance Package 4.0. Performance <laughs> Package 4.0 has so many great things in it. It mm -hmm. is chock full of things for you to get, including the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, the Weed Whacker ear and nose hair trimmer, the Crop Preserver Ball deodorant, sure. Crop Reviver toner, Performance Boxer briefs, a travel bag, for to hold everything in and mm. an exclusive graphic novel. What? Whoa. No, what? that's not true. I'm lying. Oh, about that, that would be a very graphic novel, <laughs> if I may say. That is uh, oh, something that graphic. I don't too graphic. Yeah. Too graphic. Though uh, I feel like a lot of the yeah, stories we've got that. into during these ad reads um, have involved a lot of graphic detail from Mr. Pete Page. So I, I feel like <laughs> I've sort of lived a graphic graphic novella. Mm -hmm. If nothing wow. else. Yeah. So the lawnmower 4.0 trimmer uh, is a fourth generation trimmer. It has a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents. Pete, any grooming accidents while you've been using it? No, it's been. Describe in bad. detail. None? The light. The light is just uh, such a great idea. Oh, a light accident. <laughs> you've, but blind, you've blinded yourself. Right, Pete? <laughs> blind? What? Pete? What? No. Okay. I don't know why. Uh, it also has, uh, let's see, the Performance Package 4.0 also has the Weed Whacker, which takes care of your nose and ears. This actually says, oh, Pete left. Uh, it actually says <laughs> ear here. So I don't know which ear it takes care of, but it's one of them. It's either the left or the right. Uh, very no, Picasso. Uh, Picasso actually famously only trimmed the ear hair on one of his ears. Picasso? Not Vincent yeah. Van Gogh? That's Vincent weird. Van Gogh is who I mean. Vincent <laughs> Van Gogh is who I mean. Vincent Van Gogh is who I mean. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I mean, uh, there's a lot of artists that have ear-based accidents. Absolutely. I mean, because you put Picasso, in the paintbrush back there. Picasso is famous for having very clear ears. I wasn't. I don't. I wasn't talking about the Van Gogh story. That would be no, so no, ghost Picasso, to yeah. bring up in a in a, a shaving. The main uh, thing everybody remarks about with Picasso is, wow, that guy had uh, very clean ears. Yes, the cleanest. Absolutely. He used to pay for his lunches with how clean his ears were. Oh. <laughs> That's great. He probably used the weed whacker. 
performance trainer. <laughs> Alex, I appreciate what you're doing here, but let me just say, get 20% off plus free shipping with the code FANSIDE20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code FANSIDE20 at manscaped.com. For a clean trinity and beyond, your space balls will thank you. No questions at this time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to what we're drinking tonight. Now, we talked about the official drink, but I don't know if other stuff has popped up. Pete, what are you drinking? What are you checking out? Oh, we certainly moved on to a second drink at this point. Uh, Pacifico. Uh, drink a little Pacifico. Uh, beer. Nice. You know, I love a Good Pacifico. Beer. When I want a light beer, it's a Pacifico. 100%. What I would you, drink the bottle. I would drink out of the bottle, though. I've got it here. A, uh, the, oh, my so standard good. for quite a while. Wait, dude, I didn't have the choice of a bottle. Don't come at me because I'm drinking out of a can, motherfucker. Yeah, no. Take your cans and uh, and go home, is I guess what I'm saying. Uh, uh, Gr- Grippa Grapefruit IPA from Cisco, Cisco, whoa, Cisco <laughs> Brewery uh, in uh, Nantucket, Mass. Nope, Don't I elbowed the beer. I elbowed this disgusting water and it knocked over the series of bottles and cans I have set up here. <laughs> uh, and I'm drinking, as usual, a Mountain Dew. No, you are hot. not. No, mm. you are not. That better be closed. That better be a closed yeah, fake so, drink. Yeah, yeah so, it's so, good. Pansy. Good Crack man. Crack it open. Come on. I will at some point. I still don't want to drink a Mountain Dew at night. It'll really keep me up. (laughs) Next time we're doing one of the early uh, tapings, we should definitely crack one up. Absolutely. Next time we do Candy Men. I believe um, the official slogan for Mountain Dew is do the do during daytime. (laughs) (laughs) They don't want you to do the do at night. (laughs) Mountain Dew, not after 4 p.m., buddy. (laughs) (laughs) Do the do at day. Do the do during the day. All right, we got some questions here on Crowdcast. This is from Stray Bullet. Are there any modern comics or characters that you think would make a great radio serial show like the new Batman The Audio Adventures? I'll go first, Lock and Key. Uh, and Kevin points mm-hmm. out Audible did Lock and Key six years back. It had Tatiana Maslany as Dodge, and it was very good. So yeah. not that one, but other comics that you would want to see as an audio drama. I want to see Concrete as an audio oh. drama. Wow, great That's a good answer. Call. Very wordy and also yeah, very moody, sort of emotional, wordy, moody, great, philosophical. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was thinking of concrete this week a lot, Pete, and I. We will discuss it at a later date. Um, okay. The answer I was going to have um, has left my brain with all that concrete talk, oh, but I will no doubt think of it in a second. Well, well, Ooh, what about headlopper? Oh, headlopper would yeah. be good. Starman, no. headlopper. What other thing are you? No, we don't. Doing? Here's the thing, guys. We don't have to say the things that we always say. We can well, say other answers, like as if we're constantly looking at the work in front of us and examining what it is. Kevin, you know, here's the know answer you I had. Love Squirrel Girl. All right, stop bringing it up every time. I think Tom King's work would translate mm-hmm. very well to audio. I think he does a great job of really uh, speaking in characters, having his characters speak in their own voices, which would translate um, greatly to to radio. I think Rorschach in particular would be a really good choice there. That would work really, really that, well as a radio. That drama. was my first thought, but I expanded because I think Strange Adventures as well, mm-hmm. especially with um, jumping between the two character points of view um, uh, in between each issue, I thought would be very cool for a radio. Yeah, you could even give it two different radio tones. Do the Ron sections is like a very old school radio serial type thing. And then yeah. cut back and forth to something more realistic. Like a podcast, like they're doing the rest of it on a podcast or something. Oh, man. Imagine doing a podcast. That'd be crazy, dude. This is from Nelson Martinez over on uh, YouTube. Have you guys checked out Squid Game yet? I binged and loved the show. Would love to hear your thoughts on it. I am dying to watch that. That has been a runaway hit on Netflix and a surprise hit, too, which yesterday they said is on pace to be their biggest show of all time. What? uh, Yeah. Which I don't think anybody, including Netflix, even expected. They seem surprised no. about it as well. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. basically, uh, it's a Korean drama, I believe. It's sort of like a Hunger Games type thing, uh, but seems very intense, very exciting, very fun. But I haven't checked it out yet. I also haven't watched it yet, but it has um, jumped onto my list of things to watch. I am just getting into Foundation right now. Foundation. Oh, yeah. Wait, what do you think? Uh, it's good. And it's dense off the jump i also want to be like this is a real dune uh drop it's like a Mm -hmm. dune punch in the face before dune comes out yep um but i guess that's what they want yeah yeah definitely 
I mean, I think it's just coincidence that they're coming out at the same time, but it definitely feels like, well, got here a month earlier. There you go. Beat you, dude. Suck uh, it, dude. Suck it, dude. Suck it, Diddy <laughs> This This is from Kevin. What are some of your favorite serialized comic strips? Um, I'll tell you what. It's, I haven't read a Golden ton of comic Grams. strips. Golden, uh, Golden Grams? Grams. Yeah, that's a serial. Yeah. That's a serial. Oh, Not I a comic, Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Alex, uh, so mad. and then, So mad uh, right out of the box. Count Chocula? That'll make you less mad? Mm-hmm. What's it that? Um, Does Bloom County count? Mm, I mean, I think serialized are sort of like the uh, the Spider-Man strip. Sure. Uh, you're, where they're telling a, a long story over time. And honestly, when Boom I would have as a comic book reader, I don't think they were really telling a, a continuing story. Um, when I was reading comics and then being like, I like comics, let me read the Spider-Man strip. I was like, what? What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 100%. Be... That's, I used to read the comics page, not every day, but all the time. I loved reading it. When I got to the serialized ones, I'd be like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> and I, would, I would read it and it would just be Peter Parker being like, I don't know if I should go, Mary Jane, and her being like, you should. The end. I was like, how is this? <laughs> what is this? What information is this here? Yeah, this is not enough. I need more. And, and everyone was signed, like Stan Lee. I was like, you signed that? Is it done? I don't think it, it's done. Well, it's also because you look at, like, a regular comic strip. There's at least one joke there. Most of the serialized comic strips, nothing happens. Yeah. You have to read it for an entire week to get anything. What's What's that worth? Nothing. <laughs> um, in the comments, a lot of people shouting out Calvin and Hobbes. Um, yeah, not super serialized, uh, but I—I I mean, Calvin and Hobbes, uh, top. Uh, when Legendary. that was coming out, when that got the color bump uh, in the in the full color uh, spread, like, whew, just so good. Um, Kevin says, Sunday. "No, Dick Tracy, love." Um, no. Okay. Uh, let's see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is. From Stanley over on YouTube, do you guys generally prefer comics using comedy, drama, or action? Ooh, great question. I mean, truly, my answer is a blend of all three. I think comedy is very hard in comics. Not a lot of comics do it super well. When there's a comic that can uh, have great action, great narrative drama, and still have a couple bits of fun in there, I think that's the top marks. Yeah. Cool. This is from Pablo. Any news from the loft yet? Pablo was asking about our own live performance space, mm. the pit loft. They've started to do some shows occasionally, but we are not doing it's yeah, those it's shows mainly there. just like improv shows and stuff right now. They haven't it's like improv jams. A, yeah. Yeah, a lot of jams, a lot of yeah. They're trying to kind of get people going back to the theater, building it back up a little bit. Well, let me just quick comment on the New York comedy scene. It's hard out there right now. A lot of um, there's a lot of sort of venues bubbling up and trying to find their spot. And it's not easy right now. Not a lot of people are going out to see shows right now. I do think there's a lot of like sort of Brooklyn based comedy shows that are are doing pretty well from what I've heard. But um, I worry that this, the comedy scene in New York is changing. It's becoming more like the LA comedy scene or something where it's, they're just fewer shows across the board. Hmm. So, yeah, but we'll, we'll be back in person at some point. Uh, this is from Edward Doherty before the current era of comic book popularity. What films or TV did you enjoy because they had obscure references to comics like the silver surfer conversation in crimson tide? Oh, sick ref, wow. sick ref. That is a sick ref. I yeah. mean, this is an answer that is already dated, but when I watched Mall Rats and they mm-hmm. talked about comics, I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are in my head. Yeah. Uh, I man, I, I love the elevator conversation. I don't know how many kids have yelled at about the, the whole escalator thing. Is this a Mall yes. Rats reference? That's a Mall yeah. Rats reference, and it's not about comics. It's just telling a kid to stay off the escalator. All it's right. important. This is, again, from Pavlo. Have you ever fought for your right to read comics as far as what people say about them? Pete, I believe that's for you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I used to, you know, get beat up for reading comics. It was it was real, um, you know. Can I ask you, and please don't, if this is a harsh memory, don't, don't answer, but, like, how did that go down? Like, it was literally like someone saw you reading a comic 
or and then they were like, let's get him? Or was it more like that guy's a nerd because he read comics? I've seen him over time. I want yeah, to it's the nerd thing. I mean, I had Coke bottle uh, glasses and, you know. Like, and to be clear, that was like literal co- Coke bottles that you yeah, were. Yeah, then I did Coke They were full. They were because Coke I was bottles. a nerd. They were cocaine bottle glasses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cocaine. That's, people don't talk about that too much, how nerdy it was to do tons that's of right. cocaine back Now yeah. it's all mainstream. Go, just it's like cool. comics. Hey. Yeah. Cocaine used to be for nerds, and now it's cool. Just like Did you guys see the movie American Psycho? Because I remember seeing that, and people were like, what's this fucking nerd doing on screen? <laughs> this asshole Patrick Bateman. Stuff him in a yeah. locker. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Get out. Come on. Yeah, but being shoved in lockers and you know uh, stuff like that was not fun, but unfortunately it was part of my uh, uh, comeuppance, my you know, growing up as a child. Mm. And uh, sorry, just to say, you grew up in... Uh, 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 you grew up in a 1950s movie, Pete? Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We've got a question here from Randolph on Crowdcast. Was the Pussycats of Riverdale episode a official backdoor pilot? Sorry if this is asked when it was aired. Surprisingly, for anybody who watched it, it was not a backdoor pilot. It was just crazily a regular episode of Riverdale that had all the trappings of a backdoor <laughs> pilot and ended teeing off a spinoff for Josie and the Pussycats that may never happen uh yeah i think we we did talk about this on the riverdale podcast i think the idea this is me just sort of supposing a bunch of stuff but my best guess here is when you're doing a back to our pilot there's an expectation of are we going to pick this up to series there are conversations about this more likely what they probably said was hey it would be great to have a pussycat spinoff we don't necessarily have any plans for it but CW, WB, would you okay if we build this like this and just kind of put that in there? And they're probably like, sure, that sounds fine. That's fun. That's a typical Riverdale kind of thing to happen. And then they'll take a look at the online conversation, the streaming numbers, etc. And then if there is enough demand there, have an actual conversation about a spinoff. Yeah, I think that sounds about right. Um, it's yeah. a, the rare, Wait. like, n- go ahead. I was just going to say, as a line producer, you do that, deal with that a lot, right? Looking at numbers, look, you know. Looking at numbers? Yeah, I yeah. guess. Um, I mean, don't we all look at numbers mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. on our day-to-day basis? But when you're working a, a line, a couple of numbers when you're right producing now. a line, like it's just constantly, you know. Producing a line, you say. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you do. So people, man, we should probably explain this. We've done this bit a lot, but a line producer, you guys have seen the matrix. There are all those numbers falling down the yeah, screen exactly. the line. Yeah. Each line producer is in charge of one of those lines. Yep. As My job line. is to make sure all the numbers are in a line. And it's really hard because a lot yeah, of the you numbers. You decipher it, you know, and kind of mm-hmm. like translate it into something that people can understand as the. Yes, as yes, the... yes. As it comes down the screen. And I feel like I, just to do a, a sort of a service for people who listen to this, uh, maybe not every episode, I am not a line producer. <laughs> That's a very specific <laughs> job. And that you, is not my job. You have been a line producer. Though. I have That's never been a line producer. I've worked many jobs in production uh, all across the map, but I have never, a line producer is someone who is like very high up and in charge of the mo- of vast sums of money. Something that- Really? Uh, yes. Uh, line okay. producers who make sure everyone gets paid. Wow, and that's I- a big job. Congratulations, Justin. <laughs> yeah, I'm proud of you, buddy. All right, we got one last question here. This is from Liwana Nana. Have any of you shot murder hornets at children lately? People either really love this question or get grumpy at me about it. The suspense is killing me. Uh, oh, and there's a follow-up. Also, what's your favorite anti-corporate Dairy Queen? Wow. Oh, well, this these is feel just... targeted to Pete uh, yeah, from is... Pete's this house. Honestly, <laughs> some of my favorite questions we get here on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> because there's so much backstory we need to know. Yeah, well, I'll what's... tell you why. Because we're... I know before you answer, Pete, because we're going to yeah. get to the, your answer, I swear. This isn't an arrow corner situation at all. Oh, great. Uh, but let me say really briefly when we ask Pete a question, <laughs> he's like, I'm not going to answer that. I don't want to answer that. Yeah. When Luana asks Pete a question on our podcast, he answers that shit. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I love to hear it. All right. Great. So um, I went to this uh, Dairy Queen that Liwana lives near, and it's a famous uh, Dairy Queen because they're, you know, they're kind of like anti-corporation, even though they're a Dairy Queen and they kind of like do things differently. And they're very proud of the things that they do over there. And it's uh, adorable, fantastic Dairy Queen. But so 
it was my first time being in a Dairy Queen a long time. And like, it was exciting to kind of be there and they have this giant kind of like a cone and stuff outside. So uh, there's this family there and we're kind of like waiting uh, uh, in line, but it turns out is the, that's where you pick up your ice cream line, not the place, the order line, you know, kind of rookie move on my part. Mm. Uh, so uh, I'm about to kind of like, you know, uh, run in line here uh, with excitement for my ice cream. But there are the there's this family, this mom and these two kids, and uh, they're even more excited about ice cream than me, if you can believe it. Not possible. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, there was part of me was like, hey, maybe I should stop and let this family in front of me, you know, because they have children, you know, they, they need ice cream. But I was like, no, fuck that. I was first and I want my ice cream. And so as I'm standing there placing the order this giant bee like comes up uh, next to me and like, you know, I'm trying to place my order. So I kind of like kick this bee and I kick kicked the bee. It. Yeah. I kicked the bee and I kicked it right at this kid and the kid starts screaming because the bee stings this little kid. And the mom is like <laughs> oh looking God. at me like, what the fuck did you just do to my kid? And so she's dragging this kid away screaming. But the heartbreaking part was the other the other kid because he's just looking at his brother and then looking at the ice cream like I was so I was this close to getting ice cream. But now the mom's like dragging them all back to the house to get like medication for, you know, because the kid's probably allergic or something. Well, died. Died that's not kid, necessarily kid probably true. died of a bee or stick or whatever. <laughs> probably. But man, I tell you guys, Dairy Queen worth murdering kids over. It is now, great ice cream. Let me ask you, Pete. What sure. in this B moment? What made mm -hmm. you think kick? Because I feel like you've been watching too much Ted Lasso, uh, perhaps that you feel like you have some sort of uh, foot, like foot is the way to attack something. Well, it was in my defense by flying around my legs, so that's why kick mm. was the thing that happened. Yeah, hmm. I just didn't know you had the skill to target that truck because I'm kick assuming you kicked it. You kicked that B at that kid purposefully to get him out of your way for the ice cream. Cause he was sort of making inroads toward your Dairy Queen moment. I uh, I wish, uh, no, I don't have that kind of control. Wait, when did this happen? Because I remember there was a big report about the Dairy Queen bee death and I'm not sure if it's the same. <laughs> yeah, it could be unrelated. Oh my God, please don't one. tell me. And let me ask you, how often do you call Liwana your Dairy Queen? That's <laughs> uh, not, nope, 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 nothing. Nope. All right, Feels we're gonna like, move on with our next section, which is Feels trivia. like an idea. It feels like an option. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna move on trivia, and for that, we're going to turn it over to Pete LePage. All right. This is the part we give back to you, the lovely audience. Our, what was the pause you, there? I didn't know if you had, if you were going to be like, we selected someone because we. No, I'll let you know Google spread. He's been stung. He's been stung by many bees right now. Pete is <laughs> fully engorged. Currently being stung by bees. This part we give back to you, the lovely audience. It's an opportunity to win twenty-five free dollars in the form of a gift card to online to Midtown Comics. So if you would like a Pablo gift card. just raised his hand. All right, Pablo. There we Come go. Come on in, Pablo. Okay, we're gonna bring Pablo into the stream, and then Pablo is probably going to win twenty-five dollars. So that's pretty exciting. Oh, that's very. Exciting. We shall see. That kid thought he was gonna probably get ice cream at Dairy Queen, and <laughs> he had a harsh reality oh, let's see presented to him. Pete kicks a virtual bee at Pablo. Yeah. Well, <laughs> do, right. Did we run out of things to say? Right. Oh, I, I, I felt the cue is coming up. There it is. Oh, yeah. uh, hey, Hello. Pablo. Pablo. How are you? Pablo. Good evening, fellas. All right. All right, so today's trivia is on topical comic news and a small nod to the legend Melvin Van Peebles. Please listen okay. to all three options oh, no, before no. making your selection. All right, here we go. Question number one. Who is the new host of the Phoenix Force and getting their own new solo series? Is it A, Echo, B, Okoye, or is it C, Holly Berry? So it's either A... Or you could pick B. I have to go with A. A is correct. Nice. Echo. Uh, getting her own series. Very excited about that. Should be cool. All right, here Very we go. Cool. Question number two. Batman the Imposter asks the question, what if blank? Is it A, Batman existed in the real world, B, 
what if Batman lived on Staten Island? Or is it C, Eartha Kitt? So it's either A, what if Batman was real? Or you could be completely wrong. I won't, because it will be A. A is nice. correct. Yeah. So if Batman lived on Staten Island, he would also be real. Mm, would he? Or would he be a caricature? Let me ask you, do you know where Stat- Staten Island is real? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. I'm just saying, okay. if you saw Pete Davidson, would you think to yourself, this is a real person, or is this a well, caricature? Not. Definitely but not. Not real, not a real person. That's okay, what you... That's what I'm saying, Staten Island. Check it out. All right, here we go, last one. Don't check Who's it out. Who's getting a new costume in their 30th issue? Is it A, Harley Quinn, B, Miles Morales, or C, Robin Givens? So it's either A, Harley Quinn, don't pick it, or it's B, Miles Morales. Uh, it has to be B, Mr. Morales himself. That's yes. right. B is nice. correct. Congratulations. $25 free dollars is yours. Pablo, shoot us an email. We will get that off to you. Always good seeing you. Have a lovely night. Pablo! All right, Pablo. there we go, Pablo. Now, what was, is Boomerang the secret movie that you're taking? That's right. That's good right. job, Kevin. Kevin correct, getting it as and, usual. Speaking yeah, of getting correct. things as Wait, usual. Real yes. quick before you, you uh, just I want to read two comments, which I thought were uh, very fun. Um, from Stray Bullet, Pete has stories that if anyone else told them, you'd be like, that didn't happen. But because it's Pete, yeah. <laughs> which i thought was very true and then one other one uh people ask if from kevin people ask if last week's comic book club was a backdoor pilot for a kevin podcast no <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> also very but that was from kevin so it's yes. not like that's not that's mean because kevin uh, obviously yeah, um, yeah 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 real listeners will know that we did um we o- closed only the, the real door ones. only exactly. the real ones know that we closed the book on the kevin quiz Oh, man. Last week. One thing we didn't close the book on, though, is new comics because they're coming out all the time. Folks, what are you looking forward to? Pete, what are you looking forward to that's coming out this week? Well, I'm so glad you asked me. I'm looking forward to the Sandman Universe Lock and Key, Hell and Gone, number two. Mm. Uh, also, mm. uh, Something is Killing the Children, number 20. And then Miles Morales, Spider Man, number 30. Wow, what about that was you, Justin. Well, since Pete listed many comics, I'm going to say that I am looking forward to the Lock and Key Sandman crossover issue that's coming out tomorrow. Hoof, that is going to be a good read, is my gut feeling. What yeah, a great never... what a great way to touch both universes equally. I've universe. never checked out the Sandman or Lock and Key, but I'm really interested to delve in with this second <laughs> issue of this miniseries here. Yeah, start here. Starting point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Speaking this is of starting, starting point. points, I'm very interested to check out Inferno number one from Marvel Comics, which is the final story that Jonathan Hickman is telling in the X-Men universe, at least for now. So it should be very interesting to see what's happening, happening given all the hype going into that one, uh-huh. and the fact that Inferno, the original Inferno, is my favorite X-Men crossover of all time. Oh, so wow. We'll see it's this. coming full circle. Look at that. Yeah. The oh. beginning of my life and the end of my yeah, life. Yeah, so you walk away. You <laughs> I'm glad I was away. here for both. Yeah. I'm glad I was here for both. You That's weren't there for great. the first uh, and you can check out all of those comics and many more in our stack podcast that come in the comic book club feed or its own dedicated stack feed 9 a.m. on Wednesdays. So check it out. And that is it for this week's show. A couple of people we want to thank. We want to thank Ryan Silbert and Luke Lieberman for coming on. Stanley's Alliance and New Reality is out on Audible right now and in bookstores very soon. Also, Max Allen Collins for Fancy Andrews yeah. Goes to War. Check that out digitally on October 5th, as well as in print, as he pointed out, which is very cool. Next week, we're going to have two more great guests are going to be here. Sophie Escapace is going to be here to talk about Witches of Brooklyn, What the Hex? An all-ages graphic yep. novel. Also, Corin Shadmi is coming back to the show to talk about Lugosi, the rise and fall of Hollywood's Dracula. So two spooky books to kick Woo-hoo! off the spookiest month. It of the is year. spooky season. Yeah. Speaking of spooky, it's scary how many podcasts we're doing, including Why the Cast Man. Our why, why the, the Cast Last Man? Man? Our Why, why the, the Last Cast? Man podcast is running right now. Also, Marvel Vision, our Marvel podcast is running right now, recapping What If. Riverdale After Dark, our Riverdale podcast, almost yes. done with season five here. Star oh, Guys, our Star Girl podcast, that goes up Tuesdays right after that show at 9 p.m., so we got to rush off and do that one. We got to do this on time. 
patreon.com slash comic book club to support all the shows we do. iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow. Also on iTunes, leave us a question in the iTunes review. We'd love to read them on the show or suggest a book for us to review, and we'll do that as well. We will do that. We'll do that at Comic Book Live on Twitter, Comic Book Club Live on Instagram, ComicBookClubLive.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, good night! Thanks, everybody. Hey, Matt! Thanks to all of our Dairy Queens out there! Thank you! All right, everybody. Thanks so much. Go kick a bee. Good night.